So now that we know how the cardiac conduction system works, let's talk about the actual contraction of the other dynamic system. This is what I was saying before. The normal cells cannot maintain that stable resting potential, or that stable membrane potential. And so here they are. They're at about minus 60. And they slowly let sodium leak in. That's called free potential. I don't care what you know that, but that's what it's called. And then once they re reach threshold, the rest of those sodium channels, those voltage-gated sodium channels, open. A bunch of sodium runs in, okay, and they depolarize. Then you get that whole thing where they get to about, you know, plus 20, I think it was like plus 30 in skeletal muscle. But, you know, they get to that point when the sodium channels close, and potassium channels open, and they come back out again. Does that make sense? Contractile cells get the stimulus from the conducting cells. So, if I had, so let's say this is an SA note cell. So, Thank you. 
are so much more dependent on extracellular calcium levels than skeletal muscles. All right, so once this goes up, the sodium channels close. Once this depolarizes to about, you know, plus 30, plus 20, something like that. These close. But what happens is that at this point, calcium channels open. So you have uh, most of them in the sarcolemma, a little bit in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, but not so much because that's not where the calcium is. There are no terminal cisterns. Refractory periods and neurons, 
any electrically excitable cell, which is basically your neurons and your muscle cells, skeletal cardiac cells, have refractory periods. There's a time at which they will not respond to another signal, whether it's a skeletal uh, cell, which has a very short refractory period, um, or a cardiac muscle cell, or a motor neuron, or a neuron, not just motor neurons. From here to here is the absolute refractory period. So it doesn't matter if SA node is still sending sodium in, it doesn't matter. The cells are already depolarized. Make sense? So as the membrane of the cell does this, calcium is, is already in here, contraction is happening. It doesn't matter, you, you know, if you try to get more signals, nothing's gonna happen. Because the cell's already contracting. The relative refractory period, what's happening right here in this part of the curve? It's repolarizing. So at this point, if you do send more signals, if the SA node is firing faster, then you can get um, repolarization again. This muscle cell will respond again. But the key with this is, let me show you this. This is the what's going on at the membrane. This is the contraction. See how much slower the actual contraction, the tension production is? This cell is still contracting, and it's still contracting even though depolarization has already started to happen. It's starting to relax. If you stimulate here, if you stimulate here, if you stimulate here, you cannot get another contraction generated because you're in that absolute refractory mode. See what I'm talking about? In cardiac cells, you can only stimulate another contraction after the cell has already begun to relax. That's why you can't get taps in a cardiac muscle cell. In skeletal muscle cells, if you look at it, here's the absolute refractory period, very short. Here's the relative refractory period. Well, the cell's not even fully contracted until after the refractory period. And so if you send signals fast enough, then you can get it to stay contracted. That's complete tetanus. See the difference? And it all has to do with those slow calcium channels. Cardiac muscle cells, um, they use a little bit of sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium, but the major source is that extracellular calcium. That's the key. They don't have the terminals to start. They just don't have the room to store as much calcium on the inside as a skeletal muscle cell. Now, we talked about uh, the cardiac conduction system, right? We talked about what happens in those um, autorhythmic cells and what happens in those contractile cells. Okay? Now, back up to the big picture again. Back up to the whole heart. The cardiac cycle refers to the whole heart. Okay? Not just what's going on in the uh, autorhythmic and the conducting cells. The cardiac cycle is basically the period between one heartbeat and the next. So if you're listening to your heart, you got the heart. That's, that's one thing, even though you hear two things. When we think about the, the heartbeat, you're essentially thinking about the ventricles contracting. But of course, there's more going on in that. Remember when you're hearing that boom, boom, that's one heartbeat even though you're hearing two sounds, that's one ventricular contraction. Okay, so stay with me on this. So, systole means contraction, diastole means relaxation. That's why you have systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So, you can have atrial systole, the, when the atria are contracting, or you can have ventricular systole. So let's talk about what's going on in the cardiac cycle. Now, we start out with atrial systole. Atria contract, atria relax. Ventricles contract, ventricles relax. Does that make sense? Now, what you have to realize, though, is during that same time period that the atria are relaxing, the ventricles are contracting. And that's why I've got this in the box. So in other words, the atria contract, the atria relax. The ventricles contract, but it's not like this happens, this happens, then this happens. These two things are happening simultaneously, basically simultaneously even though it's four events, two of them are Okay, so <laughs> the SA node depolarizes, 
signal was transmitted to all of the cells in the atrium, the atrium would crack. Now, if you look at this little diagram up here, as the atrium begin to contract, the pressure increases in the atrium, and that opens the AV valves. Blood is forced from the atrium into the ventricles. Now, that squirts about 25 mils of blood into each ventricle. At this point, of course, the ventricles are relaxed. Cool. The amount of blood that is in a ventricle when it is relaxed is called the end diastolic volume. And in the average person, that's about 130 mils. Same amount in the right ventricle as in the left ventricle. Think diastolic relaxation at the end of ventricular diastole. It's going to be holding the maximum amount of blood it can, right? That's about 130 minutes. Now, uh, so atrial systole lasts about a tenth of a second. That's how long it takes for the atrium to correct. Ventricular systole uh, takes almost about three tenths of a second. So, while the atria are beginning to relax, the ventricles are beginning to contract. Now initially what happens when the ventricles contract, the pressure of course begins to increase in here. The blood is forced against the cusps of those AV valves, and that forces those valves to close. Everybody with me so far? So when you're listening to the heart, it's going dum 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 dum. That's the first heart sound, that's the dum. Okay? As the, as the pressure continues to build in here, as the, as the ventricles continue to contract, the pressure um, begins to be higher than the pressure in the aorta and the pulmonary trunk and the semilunar valve. So ventricles begin to contract. Initially, all the four valves are shut because here, <coughs> the initial contraction, um, here, the AV valves are shut because the pressure begins to build, but the pressure's not great enough yet to open the semilunar valves. So we call this, who cares, isovolumetric contraction. Blood has not been shot out of the heart yet. The volume has not changed, even though the ventricles are beginning, beginning to contract. So that's what they mean by the isovolumetric contraction. The pressure's great enough to shut the AV valves, but not great enough to open the semilunar valves. Then, pressure continues to build, and blood is shot out either from the right ventricle into the pulmonary trunk or from the left ventricle into the aorta. The blood that leaves a ventricle is called the stroke volume. And again, on average, that's about 70 milliliters of blood. Again, resting heart, not, a, not an exertion, but just under uh, resting condition. So 70 mils enter the pulmonary trunk, 70 mils enter the aorta. So let's see, it took about a tenth of a second. Atrial systole, tenth of a second. Ventricular systole. Now, the amount of blood that's left after the ventricles contract. is the end systolic volume. If you take 130 and you subtract 70, that leaves you 60. So on average, the ventricles can hold about 130 mils each. The end diastolic volume, diastolic relaxation. The ventricles contract, they pump out about 70 mils, that's the stroke volume. And then they're left with about 60 mils. That's the end systolic volume, the amount of blood left after the ventricles have contracted. Now, the ventricles, as the ventricles begin to relax, <coughs> the blood is, when they contract, the blood is forced out here or out here. When they relax, the blood begins to run back. That closes the semilunar valves because remember, their cusps are pointing the other direction. That's the second heart sound. That's the duck. <laughs> 
So that's why we say that love up is really one heartbeat. That pulse. That's when that blood is being pushed out of the ventricles and hitting the wall of the artery. So we think that's the heartbeat. It's the pulse. But layman's thinking that's the heartbeat. Then as the ventricles continue to relax, the pressure drops. And the pressure drops enough so that these valves, the AV valves open, and then blood can begin to flow from the atria and the arteries. Ventricular diastole takes about a little over half a second. Now, if you look at this chart, this little diagram here, which I find just immensely confusing, <laughs> but it does do one good thing. Okay, let's see here. Um, the inside, I got this right, yeah, refers to the atria. The outside refers to the ventricles. The last part of the ventricular relaxation, ventricular diastole, you have atrial systole contraction. So if we basically, this tenth of a second is within this 53 hundredths of a second. Follow me? They overlap. So if we take this off and we add this up, you get what? A heartbeat, let's say one beat equals 0 0.8 seconds. And one minute equals 60 seconds. How many, how many beats per minute? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Follow me? Okay, so let's see. Um, one beat. However, we have 0.8 seconds. Seconds on the bottom, we've got the seconds on the bottom here. 60 seconds into one minute. That will give me beats per minute. See that? Okay. So what is that? Is it 75? What's the average heart rate? 70 to 80 beats per minute. So, everything normal, healthy heart, just hanging out listening to me draw on. Your heart beats about 75 times a minute. What's your pulse rate? How many were in the 70s? Most of y'all were in the 70s, right? I was in the 80s. So like, we're in the 80s? Yeah, we got to exercise more. <laughs> you smoke? You're moving. Though. Okay. I, yes, I'm talking and moving. That's correct. Yeah. That is absolutely right. So that's not bad considering I'm actually doing moderate, well, mild exercise. Kind of hard moderate. What you call it? I keep trying to get my husband to, to, to keep trying to convince him that, that teaching is cardiovascular. He's not buying it. Well, you do move on. I do move on. All right. Remember that cardiac muscle cells do not like anaerobic metabolism. They must have oxygen. They have lots of mitochondria. They have lots of blood vessels bringing blood in. They have lots of myoglobin, that, that protein that allows them to hang on to that oxygen. Now what's nice, at rest, like right now, your heart's burning mostly fatty acids. Isn't that great? <laughs> During exercise, which is kind of cool, if you're really pushing your skeletal muscles, they may be producing lactic acid from anaerobic metabolism, and the heart can use that lactic acid. 